You ever get the feeling that you're being watched? He's been wearing this hat for a week now, so he's really excited to be getting back to the Napoleon videos. Also, I just realized that it's been a week since I've done my last one, so <laughs> sorry about that. I think Melkor is about to lose his mind if I don't get my next Napoleon video out, so you know what? Here we are. So I was just looking at Epic History TV's uh, playlist for the Napoleonic Wars and looks like we have two left after this one, which, you know, holy cow. I remember when I started this series and I looked at like the long list of videos, I was like, man, it's going to take me forever to get through them. And now here we are, we're almost done. Now I am going to do the Marshall series. You guys can kind of, you know, see them at the bottom here, Napoleon's Marshalls with my uh, light reflection. <laughs> So yes, we are going to be doing the Marshalls after this because I've heard about them all through this series and the DeVoe and Bernadotte, Bernadotte, not Bernadette. So I think it would be fun to get more in depth with them and kind of learn more about them individually and their backgrounds and everything. So here we are at Leipzig. We're starting to see Napoleon's army kind of unravel a little bit. The allies are starting to kind of come together with a new strategy of defeating him. Our last video was the road up to Leipzig. So here we're going to, I guess, learn about the battle. I don't know anything about it, but, um, but before we get into watching this video, you guys know what time it is. It is comment time. And this is where I go back and just kind of take a look at a hand full of your comments from the last video that address some of my questions and I just kind of want to review that. But if you're the impatient type that doesn't like to listen to this kind of stuff then you know hit the reaction chapter in this video and go straight there. But right now it is comment time. So one of my questions in the last video was what exactly was the Allied plan to defeat Napoleon? Michael Harrison let me know that the Allied plan was to just kind of avoid fighting Napoleon and go after his commanders and his marshals because when Napoleon was commanding on the battlefield it was really really hard to beat him but if they could go after you know his subordinates then they had a much much better chance of winning these battles so that's kind of what they did. And we saw that in the last video where they were attacking the uh, troops commanded by his marshals and his I guess lesser commanders and it worked, you know, but when Napoleon was commanding, it was like, you know, wasn't good news for them. Our next comment is from Peter Day, and he doesn't really address any of my particular questions, but I found this really, really interesting. Uh, he says, just for a bit of fun, in 1795, Napoleon offered a 12,000 franc reward, a fortune in those days. I have no idea how much a franc is, by the way, compared to like a dollar. I guess I should look that up. Let me uh, actually do that. Um, franc to dollar. So one franc equals a dollar nine. So roughly $12,000, which I guess back in uh, 1813, I guess is where we are. That probably is a lot of money. Let me uh, see how much that would be in today's money. $12,000 in 1813 is equal to $198,657. So it's almost $200,000, which probably is $200,000 because it was slightly over a dollar. So $200,000, that's uh, that's no joke for sure. But going back to Peter's comment here, he says that Napoleon offered 12,000 francs to anybody who could figure out how to preserve large quantities of food. And the winner was Napoleon Appert, who learned how to um, cook food inside of a glass jar. And they realized that it didn't and spoil if the seal wasn't leaked. Some of the comments underneath his said that this was the beginning of canned food. So I guess this is a example of Napoleon kind of bringing some modernization to Europe and to civilization. But this is a really cool fact. I, I didn't know any of this. So uh, thanks, Peter. Our third comment is from Josh Thomas Moore, and he said that Britain being a naval power um, over a land power meant that they basically got other countries to fight their land battles for them. And they also had the means, the monetary means through their uh, sea trade to, I guess, subsidize these uh, land armies by these other countries. I never really had this concept of Britain's army or military before this, because over here in the States, we're mostly taught about the British in relation to our Revolutionary War and I guess the War of 1812 as well. The way that we're taught it anyway is mostly focused on the land stuff. We're not really taught a ton about the naval side of things, although 
I know the USS Constitution is taught and stuff, so we do get into that a little bit. But from what I remember, the focus is mostly on the land battles. And so I think Americans have an overinflated view of the British military, at least back in, in this period that you guys were like one of the most formidable militaries on land. And we, we don't have that concept like you guys do of Navy over army. Not saying that the British military wasn't formidable on land because I know you guys have always been a really well-trained military in all aspects, but I think Americans don't really have that concept of, of uh, Britain being mostly a naval power versus, you know, lesser of a, a land power. So that's been kind of eye-opening for me and it's kind of helping me understand more, you know, about history and Britain's role in it and why you guys focus more on like subsidizing land battles and weren't as focused on fighting Napoleon on land as you were out in the sea. Uh, untrue Lie, a uh, very clever name by the way, see what you did there. So, so the upcoming Battle of Leipzig is also called the Battle of the Nations, which is the largest and bloodiest battle in European history prior to World War One. And he says that he has a particular interest in this because Leipzig is his home city. I've heard that about several battles. I thought that I'd heard that about Borodino, that Borodino was like the, maybe that was just like the biggest battle up to that period. So maybe Leipzig is going to top Borodino, but that is really interesting. We're about to see like the biggest battle here prior to World War One, and from your comments on my previous videos, the battles in World War One were pretty epic, it sounds like. Alright, so we're gonna leave it there with the comments. Thank you guys so much once again for leaving them and helping me learn. But for now, we're gonna go ahead and get into the Battle of Leipzig. Again, I don't know what to expect. We are obviously seeing Napoleon starting to struggle quite a bit on land. Uh, you know, he left Russia in the, in the last video, so he was kind of back in Germany territory, but uh, we do have Spain going on as well, and I had totally forgotten about that part. So um, that's also affecting him. So we're seeing him kind of being squished back into France on both sides here. Uh, Leipzig, I'm not sure exactly where that is, but it sounds like a German name, maybe. So maybe it's in German, Germany territory, or what we consider modern Germany. Again, I don't know how all of that works still at this time. Germany doesn't exist right as a country. Not yet, anyway. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. Let's look at the largest battle until we get to World War One. Between a battle loss and a battle won, the distance is immense and there stand empires. October 1813. Napoleon Bonaparte faced his greatest crisis since becoming Emperor of the French nine years before. His long war in Spain had ended in defeat and an Anglo-Spanish-Portuguese army had now crossed the Pyrenees to invade France itself. Okay, well, they kind of skipped over that part. <laughs> I didn't know that uh, he had been defeated at this point and that they were crossing over into France. So we kind of missed some stuff down there, apparently. In Germany, the Kingdom of Bavaria had switched sides and joined the Sixth Coalition against France. So he's calling it Germany here. But I don't see Germany on the map, so what is, what's the deal with that? Sorry, I'm pausing it a lot right away, but you know, I don't know what's going on here. Bavaria had switched sides and joined the Sixth Coalition <laughs> against France. While in Saxony, Napoleon faced four armies converging on him from all directions. What's more, these were not the same bunglers he'd crushed in 1805 and 6 at Austerlitz and Jena. Prussia, Austria and Russia had all learned from their mistakes. They were now better organised, trained and led, and more wary of Napoleon. The largest coalition force was the Army of Bohemia, commanded by Austrian Field Marshal, the Prince of Schwarzenberg. His was a huge mixed Austrian-Russian-Prussian army, of 194,000 men and 790 guns. To the north, Blücher's Army of Silesia and the Army of the North under Napoleon's ex-marshal Bernadotte, now Crown Prince of Sweden. Together, 130,000 men and 536 guns. To the southeast, General Bennigsen's Army of Poland besieging Dresden another 34,000 men 
and 135 guns. In total, the coalition had fielded 360,000 men and 1,500 guns, with Russia supplying the bulk of the troops. Wow. One like unique it. addition to Bernadotte's Army of the North was a single troop of British rocket artillery, an experimental weapon system based on the Congreve rocket, a type seen here in 1830. All Okay, so this had come up previously um, in one of my other videos. They mentioned rockets, and I didn't really know how far back rocket technology went. For some reason, I thought... <laughs> this is actually really stupid when I think about it, but uh, for some reason I thought rocket technology was invented in the 20th century. But then, you know, like our Sp our Star Spangled Banner over here in the States mentions rockets in it, so obviously it goes back way, way before um, the 20th century. He's saying it's, an, it's an, um, an experimental technology here, and I feel like maybe rockets were a thing in China also, like way back maybe? I don't know, like I don't know much about rocket technology, I just feel like you had to know a bunch of science to make it work or something. I think about like space travel when I think about rockets, so I, I'm kind of like you have to kind of know a little bit about that, but that's probably Rockets really have nothing to do with space travel, I guess. It's just traveling in general at a much faster, longer distance. This is really interesting. I would love to learn more about the rocket technology, who kind of came up with it. Uh, he mentioned a rocket. Let me go back here. Single troop of British rocket artillery, an experimental weapon system based on the Congreve rocket, Congreve. The type seen here in 1830. Now, would it have been cool to be on one of these rocket uh, infantry groups right here? Probably also really dangerous because this was experimental technology. And I know from working in pyrotechnics, like even though pyrotechnics have been around for a really long time and they're very proven, you know, they can explode accidentally. You know, they can explode out and in the mortar and really injure you. So you have to be super, super careful. Uh, when I was going through some pyrotechnic training, you know, normally we'll fire it from 100 feet away electronically. So we're not anywhere close enough to be injured by a... Uh, uh, you know, our rogue effects going off. But we also had to fire like these big, you know, maybe three inch mortar, forgot what the effect was, but we had to go up and, and light it with a, a torch, you know, do the old fashioned like hand lighting. And there was always, always, always a risk that that thing would explode and it would go out and it could, you know, hit you and seriously injure you or kill you. They taught us to light it and then calmly turn and walk away. You don't want to run in case you get, you know, tripped or something and then you're too close to it. So you're always supposed to just walk away. I feel like <laughs> you'd always be safer if you did trip and you were not standing up, you know, in the line of fire and you were kind of flat on the ground. That might improve your chances of survival, but whatever. Um, those were, that's how you were taught to do it. So I would imagine similar stuff here with the rocket and learning how to fire it for the very first time. And we see in this painting, we have, I forget, I don't know what you call it, stuff coming out of the back of the rocket. That would be really dangerous so as well. So I'd imagine that there were a lot of injuries that happened with these rockets. I don't know why I'm going on about this. I apologize. I just got really excited about the rockets here uh, for some reason. So we're definitely gonna have to do a video or two on these. Although wildly inaccurate, their high explosive warhead could be devastating at close range. Napoleon's forces around Leipzig were outnumbered almost two to one. But with 200,000 men and 700 guns, the Grande Armée was still a force to be reckoned with, with many experienced troops and commanders, even though it increasingly relied on young conscripts to make up numbers. There were another 140,000 men that Napoleon could not call on. General Rapp's 10th Corps besieged in Danzig, Marshal Saint-Cyr's 1st Corps besieged in Dresden, Marshal Davout's 13th Corps holding Hamburg, as well as several smaller besieged garrisons across Germany and Poland. They're all behind enemy lines. Hmm. Napoleon was currently about 20 miles north of Leipzig with the bulk of his army. Marshal Murat was 40 miles to the south with 90,000 men covering Schwarzenberg. Napoleon now decided to rapidly join Murat. 
with their temporary superiority in numbers, defeat Schwarzenberg, before Bernadotte and Blücher could intervene. Murat had orders to conduct a fighting withdrawal northwards. But at Liebert Volkwitz, he was drawn into major combat with the enemy's advance guard. Around 12,000 horsemen fought what some have described as the largest cavalry battle in Europe's history. 12,000? Murat, My in gosh. the thick of it as usual, was very nearly captured by Prussian dragoons. The battle ended in a minor coalition victory, with around 2,000 casualties on each side. The next day, Napoleon arrived to take command. Uh oh. Children, today is France's last day. Tonight we must have won all or be dead, General Mason. General Mason of the 16th Division. Is this on? This is not. Um, who is General Mason's? What, what side is he on? I don't understand who is saying this. By the 16th of October, Napoleon had concentrated most of his forces south of Leipzig. Field Marshal Schwarzenberg, meanwhile, against Russian advice, had deployed his army on either side of the Pleiser River, which would hinder his movements throughout the battle. Napoleon had entrusted the northern sector to Marshal Ney, with orders to keep an eye out for Blücher and Bernadotte. But Napoleon didn't expect that. I like that he's like so distrusting of Bernadotte at this point. He's he just is trying to avoid him at all costs uh, from, you know, getting involved in whatever maneuvers he is doing. At least I assume that's what's going on here. With orders to keep an eye out for Blücher and Bernadotte. But Napoleon didn't expect them for at least another day. And so Ney had orders to transfer most of his troops south for the attack on Schwarzenberg. Schwarzenberg, however, knew that Blücher and Bernadotte were closer than Napoleon suspected, and that Bennigsen was also marching up from Dresden. Oh, this... wait, 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 wait. Bernadotte has, um, sorry, I just had a text message. <laughs> Bernadotte has switched sides, right? Because now he is... Oh shoot, he's in, Aust is it Austria where he is now? I'm a little confused by this right now. You guys are gonna have to set me straight on this. I think Bernadotte has switched sides. So that is why Napoleon is, is looking out for him. Okay, I, I think that's right. This was the moment the coalition had been waiting for. All their armies converging on Napoleon with overwhelming superiority in numbers. However, the coalition's headquarters were nothing like Napoleon's, where one man's will decided all. Schwarzenberg had to attempt to coordinate the actions of three large armies from three separate states. And although he was commander-in-chief, his plans still needed to be approved by Emperor Alexander, the supreme commander, whilst he also managed relations with the King of Prussia and the Emperor of Austria all of whom were present at his headquarters. The plan finally oh. agreed was for General Wittgenstein's corps group to lead an attack in four main columns, with two Austrian flanking attacks west of the Pleiser. At 8 a.m. a bombardment began along the line, as Russian, Austrian and Prussian infantry regiments advanced across cold, muddy fields. Wachau soon fell to Russian infantry, but French artillery fire made it impossible for them to advance further. Victor's second corps then counterattacked, retaking the village at Bayonet Point. Wachau would change hands twice more that morning. These bloody contests for small Saxon villages would come to typify the fighting around Leipzig. At Markleberg, 
Kleist's Prussian 2nd Corps drove out the Polish defenders after bitter fighting. While on the left bank of the Pleiser, Merveldt's Austrian 2nd Corps struggled across broken ground to attack well-defended villages. Their assault on Konowitz stalled, but with heavy losses the Austrians got a toehold in Derlitz. On the right flank, around 10am, Klenau's 4th Corps occupied the high ground of the Kolmberg, and fought its way into Liebert Volkwitz. Napoleon, observing from Gallows Hill, ordered up Augereau's 9th Corps and the Young Guard in support. Macdonald's 11th Corps was now also arriving in position on his left. His troops retook the Kolmberg and counterattacked Liebert Vogwitz, driving out the Austrians and pursuing them over the fields beyond. The advance was only halted when Russian Cossacks were sighted on their open left flank, a warning that Bennigsen's army was not far off. This is the a coalition big offensive was going nowhere, with most of its modest gains lost to French counterattacks. But there was one sector where the coalition had more success that morning. General Gulai's Austrian Third Corps, with orders to threaten Napoleon's line of retreat, advanced over marshy ground towards Lindenau. Ney had to divert Bertrand's Fourth Corps to reinforce the village and ensure the road to France was kept open. Napoleon was waiting for Ney's reinforcements before launching his attack on Schwarzenberg, but now Fourth Corps was tied down at Lindenau and there was more bad news from Ney. Blücher's army of Silesia was approaching from the northwest. Marmont's 6th Corps had had to turn about to keep the Prussians at bay. Heavy fighting broke out around Merkern, the village itself held by elite French marines, while Dombrovsky's Polish division clung on to Widrich under attack from an entire Russian corps. This was enough. This is the first mention of French Marines that I've heard, and that's really interesting that they are here fighting on land because I know Marines tend well. They're both land and sea, so I guess France was using them. Well, I don't know. I don't. I don't know how the whole like French Marine thing went down. I'm not even going to comment on it. Uh, I'm just saying that it surprises me to hear the French Marines here. Yeah, Napoleon, if he gets out of this, um, I'm gonna be really, really impressed because he's just surrounded on all sides at this point. This is a huge battle too. I think I, I think this is the biggest one that I've seen so far in this series. Uh, it just looks huge. And also I find it really interesting that all of these little, I call them wood piles, but I know they're, they're like little villages or something uh, that are just like randomly uh, placed here. They're along roads and stuff, but uh, I've never I've never really seen a map that looked like this before where you have like the main like city of Leipzig and then you have just like, like these tiny little spots here and I don't know what's in them. Like are, are these villages themselves or would Leipzig be the main village and these are called something else? And what exactly are these just clusters of like homes and stuff of people? And Leipzig would have like Maybe more of the commerce, like stores and stuff like that, where people go in to buy things and all of that. Let me know how all of that worked back in these times. From an entire Russian core. This we go back here. While Dombrovsky's Polish division clung on to Vidrich under attack from an entire Russian core. This was a nasty surprise for Napoleon who thought Blücher was still a day's march away. But the old Prussian general, hearing cannon fire to the south, had urged his men on and into the attack. Blücher intended to draw as many French troops onto himself as possible to assist Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia. His actions and the bloody fight for Merkern may just have saved the coalition from defeat. Oh, 
shell was let loose, it seemed impossible there could be any space between the bullets and the balls which rained onto us. Napoleon was outnumbered across the whole battlefield. But in the south he still had a numerical advantage. Not as large as he'd hoped, nor likely to last long. Schwarzenberg and Alexander were already moving up reserves, though Schwarzenberg now found that his were on the wrong side of the Pleiser River, costing precious hours. It was now or never for Napoleon. At 2pm, he ordered the attack to begin. A grand battery of 180 guns blasted the enemy lines. Then Victor's 2nd Corps, Lauriston's 5th Corps, and the Young Guard began their advance. In support, Murat gathered two entire cavalry corps, 10,000 horsemen, and led them in one of the great mass cavalry charges of the Napoleonic Wars. Cuirassiers of the 1st Heavy Cavalry Division broke through to the main enemy battery. Some even nearly reached the three coalition monarchs. But the ground was marshy and broken by fences and ditches. The French horses were soon exhausted and the squadrons disordered. Austrian cuirassiers and Russian guard cavalry were coming up from the south. When these fresh Allied cavalry reserves charged the French, a great melee ensued. But the French were eventually driven back to their start line. Maison's division of the 5th Corps was involved in a desperate struggle for Golden Gossa. The fighting swept back and forth through the village, the streets filling with dead and wounded from both sides. But as Russian and Prussian guard regiments arrived to reinforce the village, the French were forced to fall back. Around 4pm, the Austrian Reserve Corps finally arrived, and renewed the assault on Markleberg, one of the morning's objectives, which was finally secured. By 5pm it was clear that Napoleon didn't have enough reserves to force a decisive outcome in the south. To the north, Merkern was being stubbornly held by French marines with lethal close-range artillery support. But despite terrible losses, York's Prussian corps continued to attack. Marshal Marmont himself was wounded twice, but remained in command. Finally, a brilliant charge by Prussian hussars triggered a French rout. Merkern fell as Marmont's corps streamed back towards Leipzig. As dusk fell around 6pm, fighting died out across the battlefield. I feel like nobody's really getting anywhere with this. The first day of the battle had cost the French an estimated 25,000 casualties. The coalition, at least 30,000. Napoleon had come close, but failed to land a decisive blow. The chance for victory was slipping from his grasp. Eighth Corps have lost a third of their men and many officers. All ammunition stocks have been used up. We have not enough to maintain combat for one hour. <clears throat> well, that's not good. Sunday the 17th of October brought a lull, with both armies exhausted by the previous day's fighting. Napoleon needed to rest his troops and resupply them with ammunition, which was running dangerously low. He also sent a message to his father-in-law, Emperor Francis I, suggesting an armistice and finally offering concessions. But the Allies were no longer interested. They knew time was on their side. He missed his chance. The only major combat that day occurred in the north, where Blücher continued to attack. Russian infantry stormed Eutrich and Gorlis. Russian hussars charged and routed part of Arigi's 3rd Cavalry Corps. 
That day, Napoleon received 14,000 reinforcements when Rainier's French Saxon 7th Corps arrived from the northeast. But the same day, the coalition received more than 100,000 reinforcements as their armies continued to converge on Leipzig. Colorado's Austrian 1st Corps. Bennigsen's Army of Poland. And Bernadotte's Army of the North. Though hey, the latter the was widely criticised for his leisurely march to the battlefield. I was wondering where he was. The next day, Napoleon would face odds of nearly two to one. It was time I mean, for the Emperor to begin planning his retreat. It's like, how is he getting out of this? He's surrounded. I write to you on the morning of a battle, the like of which I've scarcely seen in the history of the world. We surrounded the French Emperor, yeah. Uh, this battle will decide the fate of Europe. It looks like it, but I don't know. On Monday morning, the sun shone across 40 square miles of battlefield, on which nearly half a million troops and 2,000 cannon were assembled. Soldiers from France, Germany, Russia, Austria, Poland, Italy, Sweden, the Netherlands, and even Britain. This was truly the Battle of the Nations. This feels a bit like D-Day to me when I think back to World War II and like the build up to that. And that was when, you know, a lot of the Allies started to invade uh, mainland Europe, at least the British, Americans and Canadians. I'm, I'm not sure. But anyway, you know, D-Day was kind of like the start, I guess, of the defeat of Hitler. And I feel like this is this kind of has a similar feeling uh, to me, although this is, um, I don't know, probably a little bit later on in the wars compared to D-Day, but... I don't know, D-Day was 1944, right? That was pretty late in the war, actually. Yeah, this feels like D-Day <laughs> to me. In preparation for his withdrawal, Napoleon pulled back his forces into a tighter defensive perimeter and ordered Bertrand's 4th Corps to march west to secure the army's line of retreat. Oh, I thought they Two were Two divisions off there. of the Young Guard under Marshal Mortier took their place at Lindenau. Schwarzenberg, meanwhile, planned to close the net on Napoleon with six converging attacks. Why did they not cut off that line of retreat? I don't understand that. Um, you think they would take some of these guys down in the south and have them go around or from the north just to cut off that, that line right there, offer some resistance so it's not so easy for Napoleon to escape. I mean, I mean, I would think you would want to do that. You just to surround him completely and get him here. So do they, surely they were aware of that, that road right there. They, do they not have enough guys to, uh, enough soldiers to do that or something? Fighting in the south began around 8 a.m. The Austrians took Derlitz, but Marshal Udineau led a counterattack at the head of a young guard division and drove them out again. Schwarzenberg was so alarmed by this reverse that he sent orders to recall Gulai's 3rd Corps. General Barclay's troops initially faced little opposition as they took Wachau and Liebert Volkwitz, scenes of such bitter fighting two days before, but now scarcely defended. Barclay then paused, waiting for Bennigsen to get into position on his right before continuing his attack. Bennigsen's troops had more ground to cover, but towards noon, they'd driven back Macdonald's infantry and taken their objectives. They would now wait for Bernadotte's army to link up on their right. But the Army of the North was again making slow progress, for which many again blamed its commander who seemed exceedingly cautious about facing his old master in battle. Blücher, in contrast, did not hesitate to launch Russian infantry against Leipzig's northern defences, though their attack failed with heavy losses. If all were demoralised and he appeared, his presence... If all were demoralised and he appeared, his presence was like an electric shock. 
all shouted, Viva the Emperor. I know, I, I sound like an American trying to uh, say French words, which is not good. And everyone charged blindly into the fire. So they're talking about if they see Napoleon. It was like a, an electric shock, I guess. By 2 p.m., Napoleon was hard-pressed on all fronts, but holding his own. His attention was now focused on Probst Haider, key to his southern front, under attack from Kleist's Prussian Second Corps. French troops had turned the village into a fortress and inflicted terrible losses on the advancing Prussians. Probst Haider was soon engulfed in smoke and fire, as fighting raged on all sides. Some Prussian regiments lost half their men attacking the village, while three French generals were killed as they organised its defence. Napoleon even sent in Friant's division of the guard to reinforce the position. To the north, Bernadotte's army was finally joining the battle in earnest. Marmont had assembled 137 guns around Schoenefeld, which poured fire into the Russian ranks. In response, Bernadotte massed 200 guns of his own. The fields were soon strewn with the dead and wounded, as the sheer weight of fire made it impossible for either side to advance. Around 3 p.m., von Bülow's Prussian Corps, supported by Austrian Jaegers and its small British rocket detachment, attacked Poundsdorf. Grenier's 7th Corps could not withstand the onslaught. An hour later, around 3,000 Saxon soldiers rushed over to the enemy and surrendered. The Saxons were deeply disillusioned with their French allies. Their main wish now was for a quick end to a war that had ravaged their homeland for many months. The hole in the line created by the Saxons' defection was soon plugged by guard cavalry. But the coalition juggernaut could not be stopped. Towards dusk, under relentless Russian pressure, Marmont abandoned the burning ruins of Schoenefeld, while the Prussians took Sellerhausen. I think it's time to in go. In the south, Probst Haider still held, but the situation was grim for Napoleon. The third day's fighting cost both sides another 25,000 casualties. Napoleon's army was exhausted, outnumbered, virtually encircled, and critically low on ammunition. Finally, the Emperor gave the order to retreat. Oh, all those blue uniforms. Sire, we will hold on. Uh, no, you won't. We are all ready to die for you. <laughs> Jeez. Really? Overnight, under cover of darkness and early morning fog, the French army withdrew behind Leipzig's walls and at 4 a.m. began its retreat west, crossing the single bridge over the Elster River that led back to France. They really compacted themselves. There had been time and materials to build extra bridges, but in what would prove a serious oversight, no one had given the necessary orders. Furthermore, there was no clear plan for Leipzig's defence, which was left to a jumble of understrength units, mostly Poles and Germans. Napoleon left Leipzig around 10 a.m. Behind him, there were scenes of mounting chaos and confusion. The city's streets jammed with troops, guns, and wagons. Of course, he's leaving before the all 20, of that. 20,000 wounded troops in the city had little hope of escape. 30 minutes later, shells began to rain on the city as the coalition launched an all out assault from north east and south. The rearguard held the city's gates for as long as they could. 
but they were soon overwhelmed by the enemy, and savage street fighting broke out across the city. One thing I've gotten from all of these videos is that back in those days, you did not want to be part of the rear guard because that was pretty much a death sentence for you. <laughs> I feel sorry for these guys. A barge packed with gunpowder had been moored beneath the Elster Bridge so that it could be quickly destroyed after the rearguard crossed. Oh, uh, okay, after. Around 2 p.m., a corporal lit the fuse when he saw Russian soldiers on the far bank, even though the bridge was still packed with troops, wagons and horses. The bridge was destroyed in a gigantic explosion that trapped 30,000 men and 30 generals on the wrong side of the river. Panic broke out among those who suddenly found themselves cut off. Most became prisoners, but some tried to swim for it, including the Polish Prince Poniatowski, made a marshal by Napoleon just three days before. Weak from his wounds, he rode his horse into the river, but as it tried to climb the steep far bank, it rolled over him, and he was drowned. Marshal Macdonald had also been cut off by the blast, and resolved to escape or die trying. He found a place where engineers had cut down two trees as a makeshift bridge, and made his attempt. And there I was, one foot on either trunk and the abyss below me. A high wind was blowing. I was wearing a large cloak, and fearing that someone would grab at it, I got rid of it. I was already three quarters of the way across, when some men decided to follow me. Their unsteady feet caused the trunks to shake, and I fell into the water. Fortunately I could touch the bottom, but the bank was steep, the soil loose and slippery. Some of the enemy's skirmishers came up. They fired at me point blank, and missed me, and some of our men, who happened to be nearby, drove them off and helped me out. I was wet from head to foot, breathless and sweating heavily from my efforts. Marshal Marmont, who had got across early in the day, gave me a horse. I wanted dry clothes more, but they were not to be had. The loss of the bridge turned what was already a heavy defeat for Napoleon into a disastrous one. Later that day, the three allied monarchs met in the centre of Leipzig to celebrate their great victory. It had come at enormous cost. Exact numbers are impossible to establish, but in four days fighting, the coalition armies suffered at least 52,000 casualties. Napoleon, who could less afford such losses, came off worse. 47,000 killed and wounded, 35,000 taken prisoner, 325 guns lost. More men were killed and wounded at Leipzig than in any European battle before the First World War. Sir George Jackson, the British ambassador to Austria, rode over the battlefield with Metternich, the Austrian foreign minister, two days later. A more revolting and sickening spectacle I never beheld, he wrote. Scarcely could we move forward a step without passing over the dead body of some poor fellow, gashed with wounds and clotted with blood, another perhaps without an arm or a leg, here and there a headless trunk, or a head only, which caused our horses to stumble or start aside. It made one's blood run cold, to glance upon the upturned faces of the dead. We got over this field of glory as quickly as we could. even in the mood to read this after that my head is just like <sighs> all Europe was marching with us just a year ago today all Europe is marching against us that just put me in a really somber mood Ugh. Napoleon had suffered a calamitous defeat 
he had lost the battle for Germany. His domination of Europe appeared at an end. With 80,000 survivors, he began a fighting retreat to the French border. There was now no chance of rescue for the 100,000 men trapped in garrisons across Germany and Poland, though some would hold out for another five months. Marshal Murat took his leave of the Emperor, assuring him of his loyalty, but secretly planning to cut a deal with the Allies to save his throne in Naples. It was the last time the two men saw each other. Eleven days after the Battle of Leipzig, Napoleon's former allies, the Bavarians, tried to block his escape at Hanau with 40,000 men. The Bavarian commander, von Freda, had served with Napoleon in many campaigns. But on seeing his deployment for battle, Napoleon remarked, I made him a count, but I couldn't make him a general. The French Emperor then ordered the Imperial Guard to lead an attack that forced the enemy to fall back in disarray. The French army reached the safety of Mainz three days later. Napoleon himself pushed on to Paris to contain the political damage from his defeat. Behind him, his empire was being dismantled. On the 4th of November, the coalition announced the dissolution of the Confederation of the Rhine, several of its former members now joining the war against France. In the Illyrian provinces, local revolts, Austrian invasion and British naval support brought an end to French rule. In North Italy, Eugène was retreating steadily before the advance of von Hiller's Austrian army. While in Hamburg, Marshal Davou, with 34,000 troops, would soon be cut off and under siege. Napoleon's situation was desperate. But in the next campaign, fought for France itself, Napoleon would prove that he was still the master of war. All right, well, I was a little silent towards the end there, that, that little bit where they were talking about the aftermath of the battle, that just like really, really, I don't know. Like, I just didn't want to say much after that. So yeah, I guess at this point, Napoleon is just trying to keep France, which is crazy. I know the Battle of Waterloo we have coming up and I don't remember for the life of me where that actually takes place. So I can't even like predict where this is going next. But obviously they just said that Napoleon is going to, um, looks like he'll maybe win another battle at least here. Yeah, this is, this is really, really interesting. I also was looking at the map of Europe, uh, in those, those last couple of minutes and just thinking about how different it looks from modern day Europe. And obviously we saw, like I saw Switz there, which is modern day Switzerland. So it's going to be really interesting, uh, you know, going back and learning and seeing how the map evolves into what it is today. I don't think we're too far away from that happening here because I think in World War One, even the European map looked fairly familiar at that point. So at some point in the 19th century, all of that kind of got cemented, I guess. But yeah, I can feel it. I can feel it. I can feel us coming up to the culmination of all of this. But this whole series has been just really, really interesting for me, learning more about this period in history that I really just did not know hardly anything about. So anyway, uh, I just wanted to mention that I do have some social media if you're interested in following me there. I do post stuff that has to do more of like behind the scenes of this channel or just stuff going on in my personal life that I might want to share. It's also a place where you can DM me if you would like to contact me directly and also make sure that you like and subscribe if you enjoy this video. Roger and I have the rest of the Napoleon series and of course the Marshalls coming up and just like you know, history stuff in general. So if you like this stuff, stay tuned for more of it. All right, I'm gonna go eat some lunch because it is lunchtime here. Roger, hold down the fort.